Jeff Carpenter from Datastax. So Jeff Carpenter is a technical evangelist at Datastax where he leverages his background in system architecture, microservices, and Apache Cassandra to help empower developers and operations engineers build distributed systems that are scalable, reliable, and secure. Jeff has worked on projects ranging from complex uh, battle planning systems in a austere network environment to a cloud-based hotel reservation system as the author of Cassandra, the definite guide to second edition. He'll be presenting on a talk title, Building Intelligent Applications with Cassandra Spark and Data Stacks Enterprise Analytics. Please join me in welcoming Jeff. Thank you. Slide check complete. So I'm Jeff Carpenter, and I will be talking to you about building intelligent applications with Cassandra, Spark, and DataStax Enterprise Analytics. So I am working on an intelligent application right now. It's called Killer Video. So anyone ever hear of Killer Video? We are no great competition for uh, YouTube right now because. Well, this is a reference application. So this is a reference application that the evangelist team at DataStax maintains. And we use this as a way to demonstrate usage of Apache Cassandra, as well as the platform that we built on top of that called DataStax Enterprise. So I'm gonna tell you what this application does, um, what it does in the past, and what we're building it to do to turn it into an intelligent application. So I'll just back up for a second uh, to introduce myself. Uh, as a technical evangelist for DataStax, my goal is to help developers, architects, operations teams become awesome using Apache Cassandra and DataStax Enterprise. So my goal is your success with our product uh, and to be your advocate. So I've been uh, working as a developer and architect for over 20 years. I've worked in uh, defense industry and the hospitality industry, and I've, I've always been attracted to the super large projects with really hard problems, um, large teams, aggressive SLAs, and large scalability requirements. So uh, I like to be where that sort of action is. Uh, in my last position, I started using Cassandra to build a uh, cloud-based reservation system. So that's how I got to know Cassandra. Um, as I got involved in the community, one thing led to another. I ended up writing the, uh, the O'Reilly book, The Definitive Guide, and that led to me joining DataStax. So what can you do with Killer Video? You, you can uh, create an account, which enables you to upload and tag videos, and then you can search for videos by a number of different attributes. And then once you've watched the video, you could rate it, or provide comments on it. So it's a pretty simple, straightforward application, but there's a lot of interesting things under the hood. What I've shown to the right is our, just a simple conceptual data model of the key entities in our domain. So as you would expect, users, videos, tags, comments, ratings, and the like. So that conceptual data model actually drove the design to a, a large extent of what came underneath. So I'm just giving you uh, a top level view of the architecture, and we'll just talk about a few of the technology choices that we've made. It is a microservices style architecture. Uh, we have provided implementations in multiple languages of our service tier. So that's kind of cool. There is a Java implementation, C Sharp, uh, Node.js, and on our roadmap we have to build a Python implementation. And what this allows is for you to see how you can use the DataStax drivers that we provide in different languages in order to implement uh, this, this video application. So you, uh, you can download the Killer Video application and run it on your desktop. It just runs in Docker containers, very simple. Uh, we also have an implementation that we are deploying online. So one of the things that uh, DataStax has recently, recently begun doing is providing a managed cloud service. So this is Cassandra as a service in the cloud, along with our other technology offerings. So we just started this, it's just in the process of rolling out, and the Killer Video app is actually one of the first users of our managed cloud, so it's kind of exciting. 
So we are using Cassandra as the data management layer. That's the primary data store for any video. If you're not familiar with Cassandra, it has been around for a while, so most people have heard of it. Um, what you may not know is that it was largely based, uh, when it was first developed at, at Facebook, it was largely based on uh, a lot of concepts that came from the big table paper and from the Amazon Dynamo paper. So there's a good lineage to it, a lot of good ideas that went into it. The series is a like finding part of spot. It was donated by Facebook, so you have a foundation in 2010. So it's been a, a topical project for seven years. Now. It's got quite, quite a mature history behind it. Some of its attributes architecturally that uh, make it attractive are that it's decentralized and distributed. So there is no master node in the standard. Every node is here. What this enables is elastic scalability, so you can increase the capacity of your cluster just by adding additional nodes. So it exhibits linear scalability. So again, it's a very attractive feature for building highly scalable applications. It's also highly available and fault tolerant. So the copies of your data, or multiple replicas, are stored on different nodes throughout the cluster, and you can specify the replication level that you desire. And that can be within a single data center or across multiple data centers. You also have the opportunity to have tunable consistency. So this allows you to control the knobs of how much consistency that you actually require on reader writes. So if you are ingesting data very, very quickly, you can uh, turn down that consistency level and, and allow Cassandra to kind of catch up and repair in the background if you don't require immediate reads. So there, there are some trade-offs that you can make. Uh, it's a partitioned row store, and what this means is Cassandra is organized around rows and groupings of rows called partitions, and different partitions are allocated to different nodes in your cluster. This is a design that we can take advantage of for building real-time analytic applications at high scale. So we'll see more about that to come. Cassandra is very good at solving not every single kind of problem. There are plenty of problems that relational databases are great at solving and, and will continue to be, but what Cassandra does especially well is at very large scale. So tens and tens of terabytes of data can't fit on a single machine. You need that dynamic scalability. Cassandra is a great fit for that. Uh, if you have a high velocity of reads and writes coming into your application, so for example, uh, high read throughput might be that IoT kind of scenario. High read throughput you might require for a customer facing application like that sits behind your website. Cassandra does very well in both of those cases. Uh, you can also use Cassandra as a data source for analytics jobs, and that's the, the case that we're going to be talking about here. Uh, Cassandra also, out of the box, supports replication across data centers. So if you have a situation where you're trying to locate your data as close to your end customers as possible, and you're, you have customers that are in various locations around the world, this is a great feature of Cassandra for you. Um, I guess one other thing I, I wanted to mention is that, you know, Cassandra has been used in a number of different industries. So the entertainment is certainly one of those worlds. There are uh, Customers that we have, including Netflix, Spotify, or customers of DataStack. So, the architecture that I'm going to show you is probably not exactly what they have going on in those companies, but it, it, it's probably not a whole lot different uh, all the same. We have an implementation of Apache Cassandra that is the core of DataStack Enterprise. We call it DSE Core. So, this is what we call the best distribution of Apache Cassandra. It's production certified and it has performance improvements and enhancements over the open source project. It also uh, has some advanced deployment kind of options that I'll tell you about if I have time at the end. So with uh, core of Cassandra, we then layer and integrate on top of that other technologies that you really need to have a complete data platform for building cloud-based applications. So core Cassandra database, and then on top of that, we provide search integration, so you can have search capabilities on top of Cassandra. We provide a Spark integration called DSE Analytics. We have our newest integration is a graph database, which we're really excited about. Uh, and, uh, and I will be showing you um, some recommendation engines based on that graph implementation in just a minute. We also have data stacks drivers that are kind of the de facto 
uh, drivers that everyone uses, even for open source Apache Cassandra, as well as DataSox Enterprise, and Ops Center, which is our tool for managing and maintaining your clusters. And finally, DataSox Studio, which is our new development environment, which features a notebook style of interaction. So now I'm going to talk application details. Uh, we're not going to look at the whole data model here, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about how this works from a practical perspective if you're building an application uh, that's based on Cassandra. So in Cassandra, we use a query first design approach. So what we did for Killer Video is uh, starting with a user interface design, taking the interactions and the queries that we're going to need in order to populate those screens, that helped us identify what tables and queries we needed to have. So this leads to some denormalized data and some duplication. There are multiple tables in Killer Video that store videos. I've only shown just one of them to the right in the interest of space, but you see the syntax uh, of the Cassandra query language, CQL, is what's being shown up here. And it, it looks fairly similar to standard SQL with some differences. And this particular table uh, allows you to look up a video if you know its unique identifier, which is something that you do know in some cases. In other cases, you're just searching for videos, so that you'll be using a different table. So the way that this maps onto our application architecture is, as I mentioned, we have a microservices architecture, services for managing users, videos, ratings, comments, statistics, uh, and there's also a search service for videos. And what I've shown here in this bottom layer is the tables that are resident in our DataStax Enterprise deployment. So each microservice owns a set of denormalized tables corresponding to one particular data type. You also might notice that I've shown this suggested videos service in gray. And why is that? If you were to download the Killer Video application and run it yourself today, you would notice uh, once you logged into the application that there are no recommended videos for you. It's a little bit of a poor user experience, but we've left that as a placeholder for ourselves. And uh, just this week, we've completed our first implementation of a recommendation service. So I'm gonna talk about that for you. The goal here is to add a personalized recommendation engine that takes into account what videos have been liked or highly rated by other users. So our very first implementation is actually pretty simple from an implementation perspective. There's not a lot of code behind it. We're gonna make use of data that we already have, that we're already storing in Killer Video. So it's just based on the users that are in the application, the videos, uh, the, the ratings that we have, and the viewing statistics, who has viewed what video. So if we were going to do this in a traditional analytics approach, we might do something like this. We might have uh, an ETL tool or uh, some kind of streaming, maybe if our application is emitting events, which we use to get the data into a separate analytics cluster, on top of which we might have um, a standard business intelligence application that is kind of accessing data that we have in our data lake. We then might you know, do some different algorithmic work to identify recommendation calculations that we might either code them back into our original application or we might um, calculate, pre-calculate some recommendation scores for specific videos that we would load back into the system. And there's nothing wrong with these approaches. They're just not real-time approaches. So if we would like to get a, a little bit faster and close that loop on real-time, that's really what our objective here is in this case. So going back to the architecture to show you what we're adding here. Uh, first of all, this particular implementation is using our DataStax Enterprise Graph implementation. So that, again, it's a new, relatively new product for us that we're super excited about, and there is a lot of excitement about graph databases in general that, uh, that is kind of out there right now. So we've created a graph schema that references existing data in our data model. Then uh, we create a graph that points at that data that we're storing in Cassandra, and uh, we have an implementation that we've created of the suggested videos service that is performing a traversal of the data in that graph in order to produce recommendations. We're doing this in real time. 
So a little bit about our data stacks enterprise graph. Um, this is a graph database that we've actually implemented on top of Cassandra. So what we did is take the Titan DB open source database, uh, integrate that on top of Cassandra, and the query language is something called Gremlin, which is based on the Apache Tinkerpop project, which is a, a pretty industry standard. It's kind of emerging as the industry standard API for graph databases. And uh, we've taken Graph and we've integrated it. It's not only uh, well integrated with DSE Core, it actually integrates search and analytics. Uh, so it uses our DSE search and analytics capabilities as well. Uh, so that you can do graph queries that are both OLTP and OLAP types of traversals. And that's managed for you under the covers. Fortunately for us, recommenders are one of the ideal use cases for graph databases. So what I'm showing you here is uh, a tool called Datastack Studio. And on the right, you see that there's a graph schema that we're using for our, our recommendation engine solution. So the vertices are uh, the users, videos, and tags. And the edges that are connecting them are what user uploaded a video, what user has rated a video, and also um, what videos have been tagged with what tags. On the left side of the picture here, I'm showing you some sample data that we've loaded into the graph that's based on this schema. And the visualization is configured to use different colors and icons so that there is some visual interest and you can kind of begin to pull apart visually what's the, um, to the digest the data that's in that graph. So uh, we have some test data that's been loaded in and we use that to experiment with creating different traversals through the graph. And then once we perfected the traversal that we wanted to implement, we then went in and implemented that in code. And that was our first implementation of the suggested video service. So a little more about Datastack Studio. It's a browser-based interactive application. It allows you to, to manage your database schema. This is both the Gremlin for Graph and Cassandra Query Language CQL schemas. Uh, so what you can do is develop schemas and you can also develop queries, run queries, profile them so you can see where you might be losing time or where you might want to speed things up in your, in your queries. Then once you have query results, you can visualize the queries. Uh, the default is a tabular, just raw data format, but you can also get it output in JSON. And there are a number of charts and graphs that you can then create right there in the tool. So it's not a replacement for a, a business intelligence tool, but there are a lot of very powerful visualizations that you can get right there in Datastack Studio. So I talked a little bit about that first implementation that we did uh, of a graph recommendation engine. And all it really did was go through and identify what videos had been rated highly by other users and traverse the graph to locate those movies that have been rated highly by other users and then recommend those to you, especially if you had liked the same videos that those other users had identified. So, or maybe a better way to say it is, uh, recommend to me movies that other people who have similar likes liked that I haven't seen already. So that there's a traversal that describes that in the Gremlin query language. And that will be, uh, if, it's, if it hasn't been checked in by my colleague already, uh, it will be checked in within a couple of days. So he was just polishing up some work on that. So we would like to produce a more powerful recommendation engine uh, based, on, based on the data that we have. Um, so for example, we'd like to take into account tagging. So you ideally would probably want to recommend videos that are in similar genres, for example. Also, we would like to get a little bit more sophisticated in how we're calculating the similarity of users. So um, not only based on the, the videos that they've rated, but based on the selection of videos that they've watched, for example. So we can also do better in terms of how we provide our recommendations by calculating some relevance scores so we can give higher priority in that recommendation list to the videos that are more likely to be liked by a user. Uh, if we are doing some of this more advanced processing, we also want to take some steps to limit amount, the amount of processing that we're doing so that we're not kind of unbounded in our processing time and our results set. Um, so 
these attributes of the more sophisticated algorithm we want to use to make this a perfect use case for doing Spark. So Spark is a distributed computing framework for analytics. Um, and it's gained a lot in popularity and uh, demonstrates a lot more scalability uh, in, in cases than Hadoop. Uh, the APIs like the res resilient distributed data sets, RDDs, and data frames are uh, user friendly for interacting with uh, data in analytics jobs. Uh, it also uses a similar cluster type structure to Cassandra. And there are a number of libraries that come with Spark, including Spark SQL, uh, and their libraries for machine learning and structured streaming. So there's a lot of power that comes from the combination of Spark and Cassandra together. NewsAx provides an open source Spark Cassandra connector that allows Spark to access Cassandra as a data source, much as um, Spark access it, accesses other data sources. So you could maintain physically separate Cassandra and Spark clusters, as I've shown to the right, but really you get a lot more performance and a lot more power over co-locating Spark with Cassandra nodes. So you put your Spark workers on the same machine as a Cassandra node. And either you could do this yourself and entail a lot of work, or you could use uh, DSE Analytics, which demonstrates two to three times uh, the performance of your own homegrown uh, integration of Cassandra and Spark. So a common deployment that we see uh, that I've shown for you here is to have a single DSE cluster that has two different data centers. One of the data centers is devoted to your operational data. We use the re replication features of Cassandra so that the data is automatically replicated to another data center which is focused on analytics. So the nodes in that particular data center are running both Spark and Cassandra together and we can have that, that what we've done there is essentially move that analytic processing load off to that secondary data center. So it's, it's all one Cassandra cluster but we've been able to isolate the processing commands uh, so that we're not impacting the user-facing application with our analytics support. And then when we're finished running analytics Spark jobs uh, on that data, we can write results back into Cassandra's tables, which can then be replicated back to that operational cluster. So the architecture of this second approach to building a recommendation engine uh, is to do to create those Spark jobs in DSD analytics that can do some of the work to calculate, take some of that load of calculating recommendations in Spark, and then write some of the results back into recommendation tables that we can then access from a second implementation of our suggested video service. So what makes this approach different than a lot of analytic jobs uh, or, or approaches and solutions is that this is a real-time or near, near real-time kind of interaction depending on how we choose to trigger those Spark jobs. Beyond that, uh, we have even more ideas. One of the fun things that we were able to do uh, is with our engineering team at DataStacks at our, our yearly gathering uh, a couple months ago, we had a hackathon in which uh, the internal DataStacks engineering team was able to contribute ideas and uh, implementations. So there were actually a couple different recommendation engine ideas that were fed to us that we're following up on and working on, on recommending. Uh, pun, I guess, intended. Uh, so one of the things that we'll be doing is using that deployment that I showed for having that separate analytics data center so we can have more complex and maybe do a little bit more uh, batch style of processing and experiment, give you an example of how to do that. Uh, and then we want to take more factors into account in our recommendation implementation. So one of the things that we might do is collect additional user information so that we can get more sophisticated in how we're defining what is a similar user. Uh, something else that we might do is expanding that definition of what recommendation entails. So maybe we don't want to just recommend videos, but we want to recommend users expand into new genres that they might be interested in based on uh, like users. And then another thing that we may need want to look at is actually using the negative example of 
de-emphasizing videos that other users don't like and actually taking that into account in a, in a more significant way in the algorithm. So really, this is a venue in which uh, you, as the development community, can kind of watch what we're doing with Killer Video as an application and see some of the challenges. And as, as we're working through, uh, it also helps us to be better at uh, working with you through the challenges that, that you have in building large-scale distributed applications. These are challenging problems. And if it were trivial, um, you know, these, these things would have already been done. So. Uh, you can look at the code, go to our GitHub project at uh, github.com slash killer video. You can download those implementations there and you can easily run them in Docker on your desktop. And uh, very, very soon we will be hosting a version of killer video at killervideo.com. Right now it redirects to our Datastax Academy website, but uh, very soon we will be Hosting it at killervideo.com, and that'll be running in AWS on top of our DSX managed cloud. Just to segue into another domain for a minute, so that I can highlight um, a couple of other features of the platform. Let's consider an IoT use case. We might have temperature sensors that are organized in um, multiple regions, and maybe I don't want to send all of that raw sensor data back to a centralized location. So. I can run uh, DSE analytics in those kind of spoke data centers if I have a sort of a hub and spoke organization of multiple clusters. So in the edge clusters, I can be running analytics jobs there to do some initial processing of the data and then use our DSE advanced replication feature to, uh, to forward some of that uh, partially analyzed data to our centralized processing location. So our advanced replication technology is actually great or cases where you have intermittent connectivity between data centers or you may have low bandwidth issues and, and only really want to be able to send a smaller amount of data. So there might be some cases which would be a little bit more of a struggle for the standard center replication and we have this alternate replication that might be a better fit for those use cases. So talking about advanced replication reminds me of some of the other things that I'll mention super briefly. We do have some uh, different deployment options that are possible with DataSax Enterprise. Uh, one of the things that's been fairly popular is the idea of uh, running multiple instances. If you have a large machine uh, that you want to make use of all the capability on that machine, you can run multiple instances of Cassandra on it. Uh, and there's a few other, uh, a variety of other things that you can look at. Um, so we have our website, DataStax Academy, where I would encourage you to go. We have high quality training courses that are available there um, that you can spend a lot of time on. Um, you can start with a one hour course on Apache Cassandra and go all the way up to the 12 hour uh, Spark course. And there's a, one of a pretty similar length for graphs and there's a lot of depth of content there. We also have shorter segments that are called success segments that uh, you can go and blown up on a particular topic, kind of do a deep dive on a particular topic in about a 15 minute span. And then we're also, we started a weekly podcast and a YouTube show called the Distributed Data Show. That's uh, is all things distributed computing that you may want to tune into. And if you're interested in the book, um, it's got the Paradise Flycatcher on the cover. Here's my contact information. So please connect on uh, Twitter or LinkedIn. I also have a blog that I put the address up there for. And I will be at the DataSax booth after this for a little while. So if you have questions, you can come talk to me there. And if we run out of time, I want your questions now, but if we run out of time, please come see me in the booth. We have a couple of really sharp solution engineers there too that can really dig down into the details if we, if we need to. So thank you.